So welcome to the Old Kirk, and we also welcome those watching online and those listening to the Dialer Sermon service. Possibly. As usual, we will have a, a short time of silent prayer for the Ukraine. And there is a prayer in the order of service um, to help you um, with your thoughts uh, in the prayers. And if anybody else would like to write a prayer for this part of the service, then would you please let me know um, as soon as possible. Um, that would be good so that we can have different people um, sharing in that. You don't have to say it, you just have to write it down and it's printed in the other service and then it can be used as part of our uh, service. We had a wonderful um, service yesterday at Wellington Square. We had between two and 300 people turned up um, from all over Ayrshire um, to support the event. And the plan is we will continue to do this monthly uh, until the conflict is resolved. So hopefully the next one will be on Saturday uh, or Easter Saturday. Um, 16th of April, but we'll keep you up to date with that um, as time goes on. When we have our um, silence, Margaret Carson is going to come and light our candle. So let's just sit quietly for a few moments as we remember the people in Ukraine. Father, as the light shines, so we hope, hope will continue in the lives of the people of Ukraine. Bless them at this time. Bless also those who have the power to change things, so that peace and justice might be restored. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, we've got pictures. Are we going to try? We may try something. You want to see whether the slide will work, Kate? I'd, no, I would go through it. All right, then, then just go past it if we can. And we'll just sing our first hymn. There we go.
Let us pray. Lord, this we believe, that in a world where there are kings and queens and presidents and emperors and governments and parties, you ultimately are the king. Lord, this we believe, that in a world where there are parents and leaders and teachers and advisors and personalities, you above all are father to us. Lord, this we believe, that in a world where there are so many people offering to help, so many people who make things difficult, where there are so many people making demands upon us and asking help from us, where there are so many people, you are our helper and our strength. Lord, this we believe, that in a world that has the power to destroy itself, in a world where there is enough food but not enough concern, enough fuel but not enough self-discipline, enough knowledge but not enough love, you are the one who can give meaning to our lives and purpose and a future for all mankind. Each of us is known to you, what we have done and what we should do and what we could do. Forgive the many things that we have done wrong. Help us to live as your sons and daughters, to know Jesus Christ and to follow him all the way. And hear us as we say our family prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'd like to invite Anne Drysdale to read our lesson. Revelations chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of the burning sulphur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precise jewel, precious jewel, sorry, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. He measured its walls, 
and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. Here ends the lesson. Thank you, Anne. We sing again, Christ be our light. This week saw another major milestone in our return to normality. The Guild restarted and 15 members came along to the first meeting. A wonderful beginning. The Men's Guild have also been meeting for a couple of weeks now. And on Thursday, the Lent Bible study began and we had six people come along. The study is called Amazing Love and is a reflection on the hymn When I Survey, written by Isaac Watts. And I want to encourage more of you to come along on a Thursday morning, because I really think that you will be surprised by how enjoyable and informative it is. Bible study is not about academic knowledge. It's about sharing our faith. It's about encouraging one another. And we are all well qualified to do that. This morning, I want to remind you that the Bible is not a closed book, open only to ministers and academics. It is a book written for ordinary people, about ordinary people, and that many of our ancestors died so that we might be able to read it in English. We should not take the Bible for granted. Whatever way you look at it, the Bible is an astonishing book. It is totally unlike any other book that has ever been published. Yet the average Christian's knowledge of the Bible is extremely limited. Consider these facts. It was written over a period of 1,600 years. It's written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It was written on three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. It contains a rich diversity of literature. There is history, doctrine, poetry, biography, letters, proverbs, law, truth, and grace. It was written by over 40 authors from every walk of life. 
There was Moses, a great political leader trained in the universities of Egypt. There was Peter, a fisherman. Amos, a herdsman. Joshua, a military general. Daniel, a prime minister. Luke, a doctor. Solomon, a king. Matthew, a tax collector. David, a shepherd who became a king. And Paul, an intellectual. And Samuel, a prophet. And it was written in many different places. Moses wrote in the wilderness. Paul wrote in prison. Daniel in a palace. Jeremiah in a dungeon. Luke while traveling. Joshua and David in the midst of military campaigns. And John while in exile on the island of Patmos. The Bible is an astonishing book. Quite like any other book. Because ultimately, behind all the men and women who wrote, there is just one author. The Bible is the inspired word of God and is useful for teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting faults, and giving instruction for right living. Yet all too often, we have the audacity to think that we can fully understand every passage and every message contained within its pages. That we can know for certain what the word of God is on all subjects. From a purely, purely human point of view, it's astonishing we still have a Bible to read. Because down through the centuries, many have tried to destroy and banish the Bible from the face of the earth. It has been attacked by atheists, by unbelievers, by ruthless dictators, false philosophers, and by science. It's been burned. And those found reading it, executed. But all efforts to destroy the Bible have failed. And all attacks have actually left it stronger than before. It is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. In AD 303, the Roman emperor issued an edict that all Christians should be killed and their sacred book destroyed. Churches were razed to the ground and thousands of Christians were martyred. And throughout the empire, many thousands of Bibles were publicly burned and the emperor rejoiced that the name of the Christians has perished from the earth. Yet within 25 years, Constantine was emperor of Rome, and he was a Christian. Instead, he commissioned Bibles to be copied at the expense of the government. Then there was Voltaire, the great French skeptic of the 18th century. He mocked the church and the Christian faith, and claimed that within a hundred years, Christianity would be swept out of existence and the Bible a forgotten book. Yet within 50 years of his death, Voltaire's house and printing presses were being used by the Geneva Bible Society to produce and store Bibles for distribution throughout Europe. One of the major reasons for the Reformation happening in the 16th century was the desire among ordinary people to know what the Bible had to say about living the Christian life. And many people gave their lives in the struggle to have the Bible printed in their own language. And it's thanks to their sacrifice that today the Bible is the most popular book in the world and has been since printing presses were invented. More copies of the Bible are sold every day than any other book. But it's a sad fact that most people who own a Bible do not actually open it and read it. Many churches, like our own, even have pew Bibles for people to use. But often they remain closed, even on a Sunday. And one reason for the sad state of affairs is that most people don't know what the Bible is. And so when they do open it, they don't understand how to read it. So what is the Bible? Is it a rule book given by God? Firstly, the Bible is not just a book. It's really a library made up of 66 books. 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New. And no, it's not a rule book. The Bible contains the story of God's relationship with his creation. It's full of advice and guidance, but it was never intended to be the definitive guide on becoming a successful Christian. It was never intended to be a book that told you what to do. It was written to inspire, to encourage, to challenge us 
to be the kind of people that God knows we can be. It should also be stressed that the Bible is an adult book. It's not something that children can easily understand. They need adults who have read it and thought about it to explain it to them. Of the 66 books, only five contain the laws given by God for the guidance of his people. 13, sorry, 12 in the Old Testament, sorry, 13 of the books, 12 in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament are about history. Telling us of how God and his people got on through the centuries and how the church began. There are five books of poetry expressing how the people felt about God in all sorts of situations. The Psalms of praise, thanking God for his goodness. The lament Psalms, crying out to God for an explanation of why they were suffering. And remember, there are as many books on how we feel about God as there are books of rules. There are 17 prophetic books. Jeremiah, Isaiah and Amos to name but three. These books challenge society to rethink their relationship with God. And these books are similar to the 21 letters we find in the New Testament, mostly written by Paul, which try to describe what kind of a person a Christian should be. Four books of the Gospels describe the life and person of Jesus. And one book, the book that Anne read from, Revelation, looks to the future when God's kingdom will be established. Now, unless you are aware of which kind of book you're reading in the Bible, it's difficult to understand what the writer is trying to tell you. For example, if you were to read Psalm 8 as a factual account of how the world began, you would be in great difficulty trying to convince anyone that that was how the world started. But when you realize that Psalm 8 is poetry, then you can see that it is the underlying message that is important, that God created the world. But we not only have to understand the makeup of each book, we have to understand the time it was written and by whom. The Old Testament covers a period from 2000 BC down to 165 BC. It was written in Hebrew. And the Old Testament is really the history of the people of Israel and how the state of Israel began and how their relationship with God grew and developed. And knowing that helps you to understand some of the more confusing parts of the Old Testament. For example, why were there so many wars? The people had not yet learned that war was not God's way to deal with problems. And sadly, that lesson is still being learned today. The New Testament, on the other hand, covers the time from 40 AD up to 100 AD and was written in Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek. Hebrew was the traditional written language of the Old Testament. Aramaic was the language spoken in the village. And Greek was the universal language of the empire. So one of the major problems we have in Scotland is that the words we read have to be translated from the original language into English. And that can sometimes lead to misunderstandings about the meanings of words. Which is why it can be good to have more than one translation of the Bible. Because if there is a Hebrew word that has no direct English equivalent, you'll be able to see two or three other ideas about its meaning. And between them, you might be able to work out what the author was trying to say. The New Testament is a record of the life and teachings of Jesus and of the effect that he had on the world since his death. Knowing when the Gospels were written and the political background also helps to put his teaching into context. The Bible is also a book full of promises, some 5,000 in total. So there's a great deal of encouragement and challenge in the pages. But we have to read it, and we have to understand what it is we are reading. And one of the best ways to read the Bible is not to start at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Because by the time you've tried to plough your way through the rules and regulations concerning burnt offerings in Leviticus, you will have given up. The best way to read the Bible is to use a reading planner. And these planners avoid the genealogies and the lists of rules and stick more to the stories or important passages. 
And planners also help to put the Bible into a chronological order. Because as we have it, the Bible is more a collection of styles of writing, histories, prophecies, narrative, than an attempt to tell the story from beginning to end. So planners can help you to read right through the Bible in an organized and structured way. And if anyone wants a copy, come and see me. The men and women of the 16th century died so that we might have this opportunity. Don't waste it. Read your Bible and see what God has done, is doing, and is going to do for you. It was written for your benefit. So don't leave your Bible to gather dust on a shelf. Wear it out by reading it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the next time the Bibles had to be changed in the old kirk, it was because the old ones were falling to bits from overuse? And remember, the Bible is tough. It has survived attacks in the past, and it will survive anything our generation can throw at it. The better you know your Bible, the less likely you are to be taken in by those so-called experts who claim to know everything. And the more likely you are to be obedient to the Word of God. So if you want to learn more about it, ask me for a copy of the Lent study. And then, who knows, you might even come along and teach the rest of us a thing or two. Amen. Now I'd like to invite Brian McEnroy to lead us in prayer. Our prayers for other people. Let us pray. Lord God in heaven, as springtime begins and as warmth at last returns to the air and colour to our fields, we thank you for the world you have created. We thank you for the beauty of a golden sunrise, the budding leaves and a hopeful good harvest to come. We thank you for our families and the love that we have known, the comfort that we have enjoyed, the happiness that we have tasted. Help us to focus our lives so that every day we might be more faithfully reflect the image of you as a loving and caring God. Merciful God, we pray for all those who are suffering as a result of the unjust war in Ukraine brought about by President Putin. We bring before you especially the young soldiers and innocent citizens needlessly dying and the many thousands of refugees fleeing from their homes. We ask your help for all politicians and NATO leaders so that they make wise and effective decisions as they guide us through this terrible crisis. We pray for people everywhere who are in need because they lack food or shelter or are forced to live in lawless parts of the world. Help all those in authority and direct them in every nation in the ways of justice and of peace. We pray for your church here in Scotland and all its fractiousness, divided and even proud of its divisions. Blessed with the challenge of your call, all who bear the burden of leadership in churches in these difficult times, especially our own minister and his family and the Kirk session here in the Old Kirk. We pray for all those who are any way helping people on the journey from sickness to health. Bless all those who are ill and particularly those who are struggling with the effects of the COVID pandemic so that together we can all change what needs to be changed to make people's lives better. Gracious God, in this moment of silence we bring before you those known to us who are in need of your special help, whether through illness or bereavement. We ask that you will hold them in your loving arms. Father, we commend into your keeping ourselves and each other, our families, our neighbours and our friends. In your abundant mercy and generous grace, hear our prayers, which we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus, and for his sake. 
Amen. Thank you, Brian. Before we sing our closing hymn, can I remind you that um, we are having a retiring offering between now and Easter for the Ukraine. And can I also apologise for the beginning of the service? Um, Hopefully we'll get the laptop sorted for next week. But let's close with that hymn I mentioned that the Bible study is all about. When I survey... And now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love, now and evermore. God bless and keep safe.